Well, welcome to all of you, uh, and there are a lot of you. Um, there must be something of interest in, in the topic of today's Latham and Watkins Forum, um, and we're uh, thrilled to have you here. Um, we've got a spectacular panel, present speaker excluded, um, and I'm not going to take a lot of time to give any of them the introductions that their biographies deserve, uh, because we anyway are going to have nowhere near enough time to do this topic justice, but suffice to say that um, we're thrilled uh, that our graduate and the head of the Brennan Center, Michael Waldman, is joining us today, um, that our graduate uh, and member of the teaching faculty here, Ann Milgram, is here with us today, that the graduate of a less good law school, but a very fine person and former also instructor here at the law school, as well as, of course, the former the United States Attorney for the Southern District, Pri Barara, is here with us today. So please join me in welcoming our speakers today. Uh, so, so let's get right into it. What we're going to do here is we'll have a conversation. I'm going to uh, pose some questions and probably interject some of my own thoughts as we go. Um, and we'll try and reserve some time at the end uh, for questions. And we'll, we'll have a couple of microphones that we'll ask you to line up at, at that point. Um, but where are we? Uh, Greenberg Lounge, the law school, yes. But where is this, where is this whole impeachment thing at this point? The, the House, which has the sole power, sole power of impeachment, has impeached President Trump um, on two articles, uh, abuse of office and obstruction of Congress. Um, and the Senate, which has the sole power to try all impeachments, in this case with the Chief Justice presiding because it is the president who is being tried is in the midst of its trial. Um, what has the trial actually entailed to this point? And uh, once we, some of you will know that because you've been following it minute to minute, but perhaps some others not. And so let's just bring people up to speed with what's happened in the trial. Um, then we should talk about the key arguments on either side in favor of and defending against these articles, and then perhaps we can talk about the ways in which this trial is and is not like an actual trial in a court. Um, but who wants to bring us up to speed on where we are? Preet? Uh, hey, everybody. Well, first, I want to congratulate you on the exquisite timing of this forum. Because we, we, I think we planned this months ago, not well, knowing what would be happening precisely on this date. No, well, we set the date, and then uh, we talked to Nancy Pelosi, and she proceeded. <laughs> yeah, uh, she's the boss. Um, so where we are is we're a few days into the quote unquote trial and I put trial in quotation marks because as you, even if you're only in the passing way following the events that are happening in the Senate, you understand that the big debate um, other than is should the president be convicted or not of the two articles of impeachment is should there be witnesses? And most if not all of you are at the law school and are aspiring lawyers, but even if you aren't, you know that every trial you ever heard of in your life has witnesses and has documents. And without witnesses, as I think um, Representative Justin Amash described it on Twitter the other day, a proceeding without witnesses is just a debate or like a forum like we're having now, although we are live witnesses, I guess, in some ways. <clears throat> and, and so I think we're gonna find out in the next two or three days whether or not this will actually take on the appearance, form, and structure of what we think of as a trial or not. And in the last, you know, few hours there has been this, or 24 hours, 48 hours, there has been this discussion about whether or not probably the most controversial and perhaps obvious witness of all, the former National Security Advisor, John Bolton, whether he will be asked to testify, whether he will be voted up by enough Republicans so that he comes to testify, whether or not there will be a trade of witnesses, and there's all this discussion about if you open the door to John Bolton coming and testifying, do you then allow the Republicans to argue in a more persuasive way that they get to have Hunter Biden or Joe Biden come and testify? What about Mick Mulvaney? There are arguments that the, the president's folks have been making reported this morning that they're telling Republican senators who are maybe wavering on the issue of allowing witnesses to come, that if you do that, there are gonna be protracted legal battles over the coming months, and that's gonna seep into the election time. So no witnesses, no witnesses, no witnesses. And what you've seen so far has just been the statements of lawyers, and for those of you who've had any experience in court, you know that a judge always instructs the jury that what the lawyers say is not evidence, that literally it's just argument, it's just statements, it's just foreshadowing of what's to come. 
So will we have witnesses or not? Um, I have no prediction. Is there, uh, in terms of precedent, um, this is not the first trial on articles of impeachment of a president, but there aren't lots of precedents either. Um, would it be unusual relative, relative to those precedents or, or in keeping with them if this trial contained no witnesses? Um, there have been two prior trials of a, president, of a president, Bill Clinton and Andrew Johnson. Both had witnesses. Uh, as I understand, there have been 13 other impeachment trials, not of the president, but of other officers, including judges, and they have all had trials. All had witnesses. I'm sorry, they've all had witnesses. They have all witnesses and have all had documents. So it would be, you know, in all this talk, this is all this interesting talk, which is an interesting topic to discuss in a law school about precedent. People argue the precedents that are on their side based on the particular narrow argument they're trying to make at that moment. But on this one, the witnesses win. Michael? Well, one thing that is different about this impeachment compared to both the Clinton impeachment, the Nixon investigation, and others is that there was no criminal investigation that preceded it. So in the Clinton impeachment and in the uh, Watergate scandal, there was a year or two of criminal investigation and the evidence was produced by a prosecutor, by somebody in the executive branch. Here they've been building the car as it's been rolling down the road, taking depositions and holding hearings and finding out things in real time. And so in a way, it's true that all the witness, there were three witnesses at the Clinton trial, and they had all previously testified. But here, they haven't been able to get the testimony of most of the significant witnesses. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to jump in on that, and, and then help us understand, so what are the arguments on the defense side? Um, I mean, Preet, Preet gave us a, a sense of a little bit the kind of, I guess, more political considerations that are that are being asserted against allowing witnesses, but even on the substantive charges, insofar as there's been foreshadowing by lawyers, what do they say? Yeah, okay, so before I do that, let me say one thing to Michael's point, which I, I think is a really important point. It's equally important to remember that those were special counsels, independent prosecutors that were appointed in Clinton and Nixon by the Department of Justice. Bill Barr is now the Attorney General, everyone, agreed after Mueller, there was no special counsel, no independent prosecutor who would be selected. So this has been run completely by the House of Representatives. And it's one reason why a lot of facts did not come out in the House, because the president said he would not, he sort of exerted this very strange absolute immunity privilege that does not really exist. It's, we can have this as a separate conversation. And he sort of did this like presumptive, um, executive privilege thing that also doesn't really exist. And so it's just important to understand that the reason we're having such an important conversation about facts, which is what trials are usually about, you know, you can you can deal with, judges deal with stuff on the law, you can appeal and deal with the law. Trials are about facts and evidence to figure out what happened and whether the burden of proof has been met. And one reason why I think it's so complicated here is that we don't have that prior record and the full record was not developed in the House. Those four witnesses we're talking about none of them testified or provided evidence. And so it's just really important to remember that there is precedent, but it's also very different. Now, the defenses, yeah. I wanna start with my favorite defense, if I can, which Preet and I talked about on the podcast we do together yesterday, which is the Ken Starr defense of, oh my gosh, there is too much impeachment. <laughs> and impeachment is hell, just like war. It's a terrible, terrible thing. So I don't really know why they called him to say that. I mean, it was a lesson in, um, hello, pot, this is kettle. Um, <laughs> like, I, I sort of rewatched it this morning just because I needed to smile and laugh a little. Um, <laughs> but there, there are some defenses. What's really weird about this, being a trial lawyer, is that, in my view, you would, if you're a real trial lawyer, you would not try the case this way. But let's go through what the defenses are, and then we can talk about, talk about them as a group. First, there are factual defenses that the president, that there's no evidence showing that the president directly linked the withholding of aid to Ukraine to the quid pro quo with the Bidens. So there are a number of factual defenses. They all sort of circle around that. But the idea that there are facts that are in question. Also, the Democrats didn't provide all the facts to you, et cetera. Then there are legal defenses. Um, the Constitution doesn't allow the House managers to do this. There's no basis to impeach a president on abuse of power. It has to be a crime. You heard Dershowitz argue that. There has to be criminal conduct in order for something to be impeachable. 
And then there's this, uh, the, the other factual argument, which I should have gone back to because I think it's, it's a key part of it, is that the president was really interested in fighting corruption in Ukraine and in getting European countries to spend more money. Um, then there's finally, I think, probably the one that's the most important for us to think about in some ways, which is even if you concede all the facts as true, which I would argue the Republicans probably should have done, right. then is then the question is, is this impeachable? And again, then it comes to the question of, does the Senate think, think it's impeachable? And is this a legitimate basis for which to impeach the president? Or does the president have absolute authority to do what he did? So let's, yeah, let's talk a little bit more about that. And um, it's assuming all of the assertive facts are true, exactly, let's go that way. Um, so that would mean that yes, indeed, the president did uh, withhold uh, military aid that had been appropriated by Congress um, for the Ukraine um, as a way to induce um, uh, the Ukrainian government to uh, open an investigation into uh, Vice President Biden's, former Vice President Biden's son, um, uh, and did so in order to obtain uh, personal political advantage. Um, over his uh, Trump's potential rival in the general election. Um, assuming all those facts, those assertive facts are true, um, as I understand the, this last offense that, that Anne's referred to, it's either A, none of that is a crime, and or B, uh, something like what Mick Mulvaney said um, in, the, in the press conference that he gave and then got into a little bit of hot water over several months ago, which is that presidents do this sort of thing all the time. Presidents all the time um, direct some action of their administration with the political consequences for themselves in mind. Presidents all the time um, conduct diplomacy and interactions with other governments thinking about how it's going to play for them politically. They candidates like Obama in 2008, give speeches in front of the Brandenburg Gate, um, not just because you know, they're, they think that's the ideal place to make a policy pronouncement, but because of calculations about political advantage. And presidents are just allowed to do that. It wasn't the only reason you know, he did this, and it's not even asserted to be the only reason he did it. But if it was a reason, there's nothing even untoward, let alone impeachable about that. So does that argument well, evaluate that argument. Is that a fair statement of that final defense as you understand it? And uh, Michael, what do, you, what do you make of it? Well, and part, part of the, where that argument flows from is the assertion both of a president's very broad plenary power in foreign policy, and as you say, there's a lot of politics in politics, and presidents uh, will meet with the president of Poland as a way of courting the Polish vote. and. Uh, it, couch their policy toward Cuba because they want to win Florida's electoral votes and what's the difference? That would be the argument. I think that the counter argument where that falls down is, is the political machination toward which the foreign policy move is made itself legitimate. So it's one thing to have a policy toward a country and hope that the voters who like that country like the policy. It's another thing to do it to get somebody to smear your opponent. The closest analogy I can think of is something that happened actually at the end of the 1968 election uh, when Richard Nixon was running. And he had s numerous secret contacts with the government of S South Vietnam, our ally, saying do not go along with a peace deal before the election and I'll get you a better deal. And it was considered so treasonous that Lyndon Johnson, the incumbent president, couldn't talk about it in public because it would collapse faith in, in, in the government. That's more like that, it seems to me. But it is worth noting, in, in, in terms of the kind of broad notion of presidential power that's embodied here, we all know that this July 25th phone call was pretty important in this, where he was putting the arm on President Zelensky. On July 23rd, that's the day President Trump said, you know, Article 2 of the Constitution gives me the power to do whatever I want. And then on the next day... He did whatever Robert, he wanted. Well, Mueller <laughs> gave his rather desultory testimony. Right. And then the next day, he picked up the phone and called Zelensky. So Quite a week. The argument that you've described is one that I and Ann and others have been saying 
I think it's a poor argument, ultimately. It's an unpersuasive argument. But it is the best argument, given the facts that have come out, given what Bolton appears to be saying. But you know it's a weak argument, an argument that the Republicans and the President supporters have not wanted to make for two reasons. One is it's bad conduct. Whether it rises to the level of impeachment or a criminal case, um, there are clips you can see of the President's defenders on Fox News and other places back in September where they're saying, well, the transcript, it's not really a transcript, the, the record of the call doesn't indicate it was this for that. And you have people saying, you have Republican senators saying and pundits saying, if it, if it was something for something, well, that would be out of whack. That would be crazy. That would be nuts. That would be a different story. Lindsey Graham said the same thing. So the fact that lots and lots of folks who are now defending the President of the United States on this different platform, much retreated from their initial view, tells you what they think about the place that they're in. Yeah, I, I was struck by how infrequently I saw people asking that question back in September, let's say, putting, putting to a defender of the president's, okay, do you stipulate that if there were a quid pro quo, this well, would well, be you, impeachable? Um, so you have, there are clips you can find of people saying, well, if it was a quid pro quo, which it's not because the call record doesn't show it, then that's a different story. That would be terrible. Lindsey Graham says something to that effect. Okay. But then there are lots of people um, who won't answer the question. That's why also you know it's bad. You have... <laughs> Senator after senator who gets asked the plain and simple question on Sunday morning talk shows. So just putting aside, is it okay to put pressure on a foreign government to investigate? And by the way, we should also distinguish between asking for investigation and what really happened here was asking for the announcement of an investigation, which renders it much more political and much more extortionate than otherwise, because what you really wanted was not the investigation of corruption, if you were more concerned about the announcement, but the smear of the opponent. Mm -hmm. Um, so one reason I think that quid pro quo was sort of much in the air in terms of talking about whether there was or wasn't is if there were, um, there might have been an argument that this was bribery, um, not ultimately an article of impeachment. Why? Well, it is in the articles of impeachment. Every single element of bribery is actually an article one of impeachment for abuse of power. It's an interesting question of why they chose not to specifically name it. And I think in part it was, and remember that in both Clinton and Nixon, there are sort of, there aren't necessarily articles of impeachment that are written exactly the same as they're written here, but it is th this idea of abuse of power. And so I think what they were trying to do was go very broad, go very simple for the American public to understand. Bribery, you know, when you get into the, was there a quid pro quo, was there not? It, people seem to be a little confused publicly with just the, the dialogue. So I think they went for simplicity. But everyone should be clear that the elements of bribery are completely, all four elements are included in the article of impeachment. And I would argue they've proven them through the House case, or they've put on sufficient evidence, and then now the defense, and then questions. But I don't think we should say that, I think they made more of a political and strategic choice not to name it and include it as a specific article than they did to step away from this idea that something was traded a value in which the president would get a personal gain. Mm -hmm. Can I say one more thing on that? <clears throat> no, Michael. Yeah. It, it was kind of like, I imagine, I don't know, the thought process was there are, um, there are problems either way. So on the one hand, if you style it specifically as bribery or extortion, I think it's more extortion, and, and you, you lay out the elements, you seem to be a little bit in the style of your articles of impeachment conceding this issue that we've been talking about, and that is you seem to be conceding that in order for someone to be impeached and convicted on the articles of impeachment, it needs to rise to the level of an articulated crime that's based on a statute, which I'm sure they didn't want to do. And then by doing it this way, they leave themselves open to the opposite argument, which is it, it doesn't rise to the level of a crime, which is obviously much worse and much more clear, uh, and you kept it too broad and vague. So I, I'm not sure that they appreciated fully the conundrum, but I think it's better that the way, the way that they did it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it would also would have been picked apart, like in a criminal trial. You didn't prove this element. You didn't prove that element. What's the standard of proof? It's a crime we're talking about. Um, but it was a political and a communications choice not to include an article saying these are the federal statutes that were broken. And I do think that while it is emphatically the case, in my view, that Alan Dershowitz is wrong and that the every other constitutional scholar more or less is right that it is not necessary to have when you say every other constitutional scholar that would every, stipulate yeah, every, something that no, might all be the actual constitutional all constitutional scholars. yeah right. uh, yeah 
but it, but including also, the Republicans' own witness. Including their own witness, but it's also the case that since this has been the practice in the recent impeachments, the public kind of expects it and assumes it, and so it looks like a gap when it's not there. Um, so to come back to this, this uh, kind of best defense and what one makes of it, um, there was an there was an op-ed written by a law professor, um, Josh Blackman, is that his name, um, making essentially this argument that uh, it happens all the time. You know, presidents pursue policy goals with political aims as well, and and that's what's that's what's happening. Um, and so one line of, res of response is the one that, that, that I think each of you has, has articulated here, which is, well, there, it would be a very different case if um, it was the established policy position of the government that there was some deeply concerning, potentially criminal conduct in Ukraine that needed to be looked into if there was an open investigation here. And I know after the fact, they've tried to suggest that maybe the U.S. Attorney's investigation up in Connecticut is somehow that, but if there were an open investigation here that an investigation in Ukraine would be helping or something, then that the president also had a political goal um, wouldn't render it, the exercise illegitimate, but this is not that sort of case. Another way to draw a distinction would be to emphasize that the particular thing the president did here was itself a violation of law by holding up the distribution of funds that have been appropriated by Congress. And that itself is unlawful conduct. And why hasn't that played a bigger role in the case thus far? I'll tell you why I think it hasn't. I think it's about timing, the GAO, the General Accounting Office opinion. They're a bipartisan group in, in Congress, and they evaluate what is happening. And they've come out with what I think is a really compelling report saying that the, what the president did in, on nine separate occasions withholding the aid to Ukraine was a violation of the Impoundment Control Act, which basically says when Congress allocates money, the president can't stop it from going out. And there are a couple of exceptions if for some, like there was national a, a national emergency in the country where the money was going to, the president could delay it. But it's very strong in saying the pre when Congress allocates money, the president can't stop it. And G the GAO has found that the Trump administration acted unlawfully on those occasions. That came out after this had, after the president had been impeached on two on two counts. I would argue if it had come out before, they would have done it because it's an independent basis on which to draw that conclusion of illegality. Otherwise, before they would have essentially been opining, we think this is a lawful, we think this is a legal violation, and I think they might have been afraid they were going to fight that out. But, but, but do you mean there would be some kind of ex post facto problem with saying it now? No, no, no. no. Just they that they'd already written their speeches it. or something right, like right, that. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Like the ship had already sailed a little bit. Yeah. Or, or it doesn't, I would think it doesn't preclude the House managers now from at least closing with this point, right? It's, it's, uh, Philip Bobbitt wrote a really powerful um, kind of response that emphasized this point, that in many ways you could say the gravamen of the abuse of, of office is, is the intrusion on legislative prerogative. The violation of the Impoundment Act is, a, is that, that statute's purpose is to distinguish between what the legislative branch can do and the executive branch must do when it comes to spending appropriated funds. Look, I think they made a lot of strategic choices here because with the possible exception of using every minute of the 24 hours, which I don't think was necessary for <laughs> opening arguments. Other than that... That was your I, former boss who made that call. Uh, hey. <laughs> uh, other, other, Senator former, Schumer, I mean. Yeah. Other, other than that, I feel like that the Adam Schiff and the Democrats have tried to be short and streamlined. They did you know, very quick proceedings during the impeachment inquiry in the Intelligence Committee. Uh, they wanted short articles of impeachment. Um, look, you know, further to Michael's point, there are flaws in deciding to go with the, you know, the broad abuse of power, abuse of, obstruction of Congress. There are also flaws with going with particular uh, you know, extortion or bribery, but the way the federal prosecutors normally sort that out is we do both, right? right? And you give people, and among other things strategically, you give jurors an option of lots of different charges and lots of different counts so they can compromise. I mean, in the Clinton case, I think a lot of people believe that one of the reasons that they had certain articles of impeachment that were put forward, it gave some people a moderate position that they could take. I'm voting in favor of these, I'm voting against those others. So you know, you can second guess the decisions that they made. I think it would have been reasonable to bring these two that are, that are catch-all and a bunch of other ones that were more specific, more including particular. the one relating to the Impoundment Act. Okay. Yep. 
Mike, I'm yeah, no, not. just yeah. in both the Nixon and Clinton impeachments, even as they moved along, articles were defeated at the relevant spot, giving people a chance to say they were being reasonable. Um, so, uh, I effectively all of the non-lawyers I know who've been paying attention to this, and many of the lawyers or future lawyers I know, are skeptical that any of the lawyering going on in the Senate is where the action is on this. That however the senators are going to make their decisions, it's not going to be because there was some you know, oration given by either side that persuaded, um, that it's just pure politics. Fair or not fair? Well, it's fair. Um, <clears throat> you never know, right? And I think sometimes some senators from time to time might hear something that changes their view combined with the politics, combined with what constituents may say to them, combined with what family members may say to them. Um, the opposite is, is stated to be true. You know, you, you were stating it in the positive. Is some, somebody going to say something to persuade someone to their point of view? And what was the big whole scandal last Friday when Adam Schiff was, was closing? He made a reference to a CBS News article about somebody who was a close, apparently a confidant of the president said, basically it's been communicated to senators that if you don't go the president's way, your head will be on a pike. That caused Lisa Murkowski, <clears throat> Senator Lisa Murkowski and others to say, well, that's when Adam Schiff lost me. So that's a line in an oration that they claimed at that moment, I think unreasonably and maybe falsely, moved them the other way. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I and, make two yeah, points on, please, on yeah. the lawyering? I mean, the first, let's talk about Schiff just for a second, because I did think that last Thursday night, there's the eight minute clip of his closing argument. I thought it was as, as well done as a lawyer could do in doing a summation of sort of explaining why something should matter. And what Schiff tried to do, and, and if you look at this, and particularly through the political lens, and it's a political process, the president's defenders have sought to make this very partisan. The more partisan it is, the better it is for them, right? It divides, it's divisive. And it more it looks like people are attacking the president for legitimate use of his authority. And what Schiff tried to do was basically, you know, he cited to Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman and said, right matters, and started to talk about why everything from the Constitution forward doesn't matter unless we're truthful and honest and we understand that there are genuine American ideals that unite us, right? And thing, right matters, doing the right thing is important. And so that was one moment where I thought, he may have not reached any of the senators, but I thought for Americans watching, it was a moment of understanding that, you know, this is about fairness, this is about more than just the partisan bickering. The second and more trial lawyer um, uh, take I'll give you is that, I think yesterday mattered a little bit in the following way. The president's defenders spent three days, and not nearly as much as the House managers, but they spent three days talking about and really pounding home. There is not a single witness that links the president of the United States to the withholding of Ukrainian aid because of election interference, because of 2020. And yesterday, and, and look, when you're a lawyer, you're asking people to be with you, to, to find you truthful, right? That you're a fair and honest broker of information. Then the Bolton release of Bolton's book, where Bolton is now obviously coming out to say, oh no, I had this conversation with the president and he told me we were withholding the money because of the 2020 election. It really undercuts everything the lawyer said. And not just that one point, but you know, you're looking at them as people who are you know, sort of carrying the president's defense. And to me yesterday, they seemed a little shell-shocked. They stayed with all the arguments they were already prepared to make. They didn't pivot in a way they should. And I actually thought it hurt them. I don't know if it hurts them publicly, but as a lawyer, I was watching, and I was like, ooh, you wouldn't want it to happen to you during your trial. <laughs> and, Michael? <laughs> and, and it's also important to remember who the audience is and who the ultimate, in a sense, jury is, which is the broader public. And I think Schiff, in particular, over these months, has been extraordinarily effective at conveying a sense of seriousness and purpose here. And as partisan as it is, you just compare how he and the Intelligence Committee hearings went with the far more partisan, always more partisan Judiciary Committee. Um, I, I think that we have all absorbed the idea that, oh, well, you know, Trump's not gonna get removed and oh, the public is divided on this. But there's actually quite a bit of public support, including among Republicans for removal. And 
the latest polls have support for having witnesses in the Senate be 70, 75 percent, and that was before the Bolton revelation. So if the purpose here is to spell out the story and change the politics of it, not necessarily thinking that there's going to be a super majority for removal, the lawyering has made a great difference in, in teeing up that point about witnesses. Um, now, you're, you're, you're also right that this is, you're, you're talking about uh, Congressman Schiff's uh, you know, performance over many months. There, the, the question of impeaching the president ripened, as it were, around Ukraine, but uh, the conversation didn't begin then. And there are certainly some members of the House who announced as part of their campaign um, for the House that they were in favor of impeaching the president and exactly what he would be impeached on would, was sort of TBD. Um, and, and that, I take it, is part of the defense also, um, that what this is really about is objecting in a broader way to the Trump administration. Um, and then the sort of what the passage of time delivered was a set of you know, kind of choice points, go, no go, on this thing that you might impeach him on. And, and it turned out that they, you know, they, they went on what they went on. But there were earlier moments and there were votes in the House for, in favor of impeachment on a number of other things. Um, and isn't that uh, at least risking turning this constitutional remedy into just a kind of device for removing an unpopular, at least in some quarters, president from office? You know, for, for better or worse, we do not have a parliamentary system. We do not have a no confidence vote mechanism. And we know for certain um, that the device of impeachment wasn't designed for that. Whatever it was designed for, however broadly uh, high crimes and misdemeanors ought to be understood, we know it, it wasn't intended to mean simply maladministration. Um, intended at the time, and I'm not aware of anyone who thinks that it should be understood that way. Um, so is there anything to the, it's not quite a part of a formal defense, but it's in the, it's in the atmosphere on the defense side here that this is basically uh, uh, a set of people in the other chamber in the House um, who decided first that the president needed to be impeached and then were just looking around for the best vehicle for that. Um, and that what they're really trying to do is just to get someone out of office whom they don't like. Yeah, and that's the argument you would expect them to make <clears throat> because you have some small data points in support of it. And we should just say, well, you know, since we're speaking to a room full of people who are lawyers or aspiring lawyers, lawyers make arguments, which is not to say that every argument is equal and every argument is, uh, is, is substantive. And so when Ann and I talk about this on the podcast, you evaluate the strength of arguments. I've seen dumber arguments made in courtrooms around the country and they get rejected because you have a process, you have a judge who shuts them up and says you can't say these things, and you have smart jurors who decide unanimously, that was the dumbest argument I ever heard, and they, and they vote in a particular way, either for guilt or for acquittal. You don't have any judgment here, right? Notwithstanding the potted plant that is now Justice John Roberts sitting in the chamber, <laughs> And I say that with great respect, but he's... <laughs> to plants? <laughs> he's, he's, he's not, he's not, there's nothing for him to do. He's sort of hanging out. I think he's gonna read some questions today and not ask follow-up questions. Yeah, so, so there's some data points in favor of the argument that is beneficial in the political process to the Republicans to say, yeah, it was, it was bad. There were a couple of members of the Democratic caucus who did, you know, want votes for impeachment right off the bat. The facts are though, that the vast majority of Democrats, including the leadership, including the chairs of the committees, like Schiff and others, and including, most importantly, the boss, Nancy Pelosi, the speaker, against impeachment. Bucked her own party in, 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 in a lot of her constituencies in, in, for months and months and months during the Mueller investigation. And the way I think about it is a little bit is, at some point, something has to give. So as has been discussed, on, on July 24th, Bob Mueller testifies, and it went a particular way. And then the very next day, Donald Trump decides to make this phone call, which is the nub of the impeachment inquiry. And I feel like Nancy Pelosi and others in some ways acted the way that I have seen judges act. And it's not quite a perfect metaphor or parallel, but I've seen judges in court be convinced, well, I don't know if this is a, such a bad person. I'm going to give this person a break uh, at sentencing. I'm going to give this person probation or a much lower sentence than the guidelines require because, you know what, it's not worth it. Maybe this person will not be a recidivist, et cetera. And then you see that person commit another crime or violate probation or supervised release, comes back in the courtroom. And then the judge is like, 
All right, what am I going to do with this guy? I, I need to make a strong statement. And at some point, th th the fact that they went from objecting to impeachment overall, the, the large majority of the caucus, for month after month after month, and went so quickly to impeaching is a sign of the frustration they felt and the, and the choice that they didn't think that they had. Mm -hmm. Michael? Well, and I, I agree that uh, Kenneth Starr is literally the worst person out of the several billion humans to make the argument. <laughs> and for those who don't know, Starr was the special prosecutor in the Clinton impeachment and was a very controversial figure at the time. But it is also the case that we are using impeachment more than we have in the past. There was one impeachment, one presidential impeachment in the first um, 180 years of, of the Constitution. And then there have been three in the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. And so there is a reality, and no president's removed. So there is a reality that it's becoming a little bit, quote, normalized. But that may not be the end of the world, uh, because there are few other mechanisms for a full airing of charges in our Constitution. And when you combine the, the actual criminal violations and legal violations, which I do think were there, but where other impeachments have risen or fallen is, is there a deep abuse of power and an assault on the Constitution that goes along with it? And I do think that this, this case there was. Uh, so this is a more appropriate impeachment than a lot of the other ones that people have talked about. But I do think there's a chance that it will become kind of a normalized thing. I, if I would, could just add a couple of things. The first is that I think there's nothing normal about the Trump presidency, right? And so we are in a slightly unchartered war waters from where we've been in the past. But the second is, to Preet's point, is that lawyers make arguments all the time. In fact, they have made this argument. Jay Sekulow has made this argument mm -hmm. on the Senate floor. If you listen, and I don't know if you guys have the time to do it, but they have literally made every possible argument they can. It is like, it's like the buckshot version of a legal argument where you throw everything at the wall and you hope that something sticks or that someone will agree with, with your view. One of the really important things on this is, look, I think the special counsel's office did an excellent job. In my personal view, on obstruction, there was sufficient evidence to go to a grand jury on a number of those, um, a number of those articles, or sort of there were, you know, ten incidents, and I think probably four or five. I would have, you know, if I were running an office, I, a criminal prosecution office at the time, as I've done before, I would have looked very seriously to charge those. So, I think what Preet says about the restraint that they showed is the greatest example, the fact that Congress did not go forward at that moment is the greatest example of why that argument gets defeated. But there are a lot of arguments that can be made. And one of the things I would really encourage you guys to do is every single argument, and one reason why I think they're making so many is that you know sometimes you'll sit in court and you'll hear arguments and you think oh that kind of makes sense and you know I read the president's trial brief and I was like oh a couple of those make sense but the minute you dig into what they're saying and you really push them to the conclusion and you dig deeper every single one of them fails in my opinion and it's really important as lawyers to say if this was true what's missing mm -hmm. what's not here mm -hmm. right which would have been that the president would have been indicted for obstruction of justice under the Mueller report. Like if they really just wanted to impeach him, he would have been impeached. And also what's not here that should be here, right? And so it's <laughs> both like what facts are here that don't fit and what's missing. And that as a trial lawyer is something you do every day to think like, oh, if this, if this argument was true, are there things here that don't belong and are there things missing that would otherwise be here? And it's really kind of a common sense test. And so to me, ultimately, you know, I heard Jay Sekulow, he was all fired up about it, but he did not convince me. Um, I think that's a very interesting point about what's missing here, if that's really the explanation for it all. So let's let's play things forward. Um, you know, it, impeachment is, is um, broadly understood as cast as this, um, uh, as this power, the, both the literal the impeachment and then the trial on articles of impeachment, belonging wholly to Congress, that it's, it's Congress is the only branch of government that's involved if this is what's happening. Um, and you know, many of the, the students here who've already taken constitutional law or perhaps are taking it now um, have read or will read the Nixon case, not President Nixon, but Judge Nixon, um, where a judge tried to get the courts to invalidate his conviction um, on articles of impeachment on the ground that it wasn't the Senate that really tried him. The Senate has the sole power to trial impeachment, but it was a committee of the Senate that took uh, I think all of the evidence, or at least most of it, and then reported out to the full Senate. 
And the Supreme Court said, we're not saying we agree with you. We're not saying we disagree with you. We're saying this is a political question and it's non-justiciable. We have nothing to say in this, sort of underscoring the, the, the idea, I guess, that this is Congress's show. On the other hand, um, if the Senate subpoenas, but actually votes to subpoena uh, Bolton, there's a possibility that the courts do become involved. So play this forward. What happens? Suppose there are the votes for witnesses, and it starts with Bolton. We know the White House would oppose. Does it have an ability? Will it try to see if it has an ability to go to court to block that? And would the court have any role to play in that, in that circumstance? I mean, this would be uncharted territory. Um, <laughs> Because of we could begin the, the answer to, to every begin, question with, but with, of course <laughs> the subpoena would be signed by Chief Justice John Roberts, which gives it political as well as legal heft. Um, as as you know, and there's a wide lack of understanding in the media, in the commentary. The courts have never ruled at the highest level whether Congress can subpoena the President of the United States. And the U.S. versus Nixon case, the other Nixon case, yeah. the nine to the eight to nothing case about Nixon's tapes, was about whether he would turn them over to, to the grand, grand jury. jury. Yeah. And they actually would not get involved in impeachment. Um, and so, we, one of the bits of combined lawyering and political strategy that the House did was to push all this into the Senate rather than suing and waiting, and because even if they got an expedited legal process, it would get up to the Supreme Court with its highly partisan five to four votes. Uh, and here, you've got John Roberts, but you don't have Alito and, and others on the court as part of it. Let me just, let me, just, let me extend the question a bit, then I want to hear what you think, And So Bolton has said that he would be prepared to testify in the Senate if subpoenaed. So let's suppose the condition is satisfied. Um, but the White House doesn't want to see it happen. Um, isn't it the case that the White House would have to get the judiciary involved in order to have any shot at physically stopping the man? Or are we talking about sending the marshals out after him just on the president's own order? Yeah, so, so I think, I mean, there's, just to step back for one second, a lot of this is about presidential power. And yeah. we should remember that the president blanket refused to comply with requests from the House of Representatives during the House of Representatives during the investigation. And so some of this is a question of Congress has given a lot of power to the president, and they sort of acceded to that in some ways in the House, and they did push it to the Senate, which is Republican controlled. So let's say Bolton gets subpoenaed. You need 51 votes um, for that to happen. At that point, and, and remember, the president has never asserted executive privilege. He has asserted through Pat Cipollone's six-page crazy letter. I would argue when you guys are lawyers, do not write letters like that. Um, but Even when you're law students, yeah, don't exactly write letters. Exactly right. Like that. Good point. <laughs> he may not have actually Just a pen right. pal. Don't write <laughs> That's a good point. Um, no one should ever write them. Maybe we should say. But he, he asserted this sort of prophylactic executive privilege. He didn't say, I am asserting executive privilege here. And let's just break down executive privilege for one second. Since we're at a law school, we can be a little wonky. There's two ways in which executive privilege can be asserted. One is very specific. And the example people have been given, which I love, is George Washington, where they wanted George Washington's letters to the American ambassador to France. Washington said, no, I might have said bad things about, he didn't say this, but the idea being he might have said things about France that he didn't want to become public. So there was a very specific example where the president of the United States was worried about a communication that he had with someone coming out and hurting the United States or our interests. That's largely not what's being argued here. The second thing that you sometimes see is this more generalized way in which it's argued as like a need for confidentiality, so the confidential communications of the president. And I think we all agree that generally, the president shouldn't wear a wire that's public. I mean, we'd all be interested in hearing what he says, but like generally he needs to be able to have confidential communications or she needs to be able to have confidential communications so that nothing comes, so that the U.S. can do their business. Now, Including that his advisors can give unvarnished advice, exactly. right? That's part of that. It, and it is legitimate. And so we should all understand that that's legitimate. 
Now, what happens with that, that is a limited privilege. And it's really important to know it's not in the Constitution. Impeachment is a part of the Constitution. Executive privilege isn't. It was written in years and years later by the Supreme Court to recognize, look, when we have these separations of powers questions, we don't want Congress to just be able to say every day, come tell us what you guys were debating when you were deciding whether or not to go to war. And so they built in this limited, this limited privilege, which is really a balancing test when it comes to this general confidentiality piece, which is, is there a legitimate need of another branch of government to get that information? And so here, I think with Bolton, my view is executive privilege has to fail. It failed in Nixon when it was a criminal investigation. Impeachment is the height of Congress's powers. There's all kinds of Supreme Court cases that talk about that. So to me, ultimately, when push comes to shove, it should fail here. Bolton should not, the president said recently, well, if John Bolton gets called to testify, he may talk about North Korea. There's no reason for John Bolton to talk about North Korea if he testifies in the Senate. He should talk about Ukraine, and his testimony should be limited to that. The question is, what happens if the president does invoke executive privilege? At that moment, it becomes really interesting. I personally would argue it is exactly as the Judge Nixon case says. This is for Congress to decide. And that would mean that you need 51 votes or sort of, you know, you basically that they would reject it. And you're right, you would have the Supreme Court marshals or whoever it was saying, you will be held in contempt if you do not answer these questions. The alternative is that they kick it to the court. I think the court would come, would kick it right back to them under Nixon, but we should be clear, no one has any idea how that would play out, right? So I could tell you, I don't think, I think if this were a real Article Three court deciding executive privilege, Bolton would be compelled to testify. Here, it has never happened. So for all of us, like we're slightly guessing, but it seems like a terrible precedent to mm. now kick this back to the court. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, I was wondering what you think. Maybe. Uh, so you have this potential impasse where the president doesn't want his former advisor, John Bolton, to testify because of executive privilege. And the scenario we're in right now is one where John Bolton has said he's prepared to testify and he's prepared to come forward. And so you have a particular kind of impasse where the default is that he wants to testify. Would the result be different, you think, through a legal process uh, if the witness himself, John Bolton, didn't, didn't want to testify and had to be forced to testify? I mean, in other words, the scenario we have is one in which you're trying to, the wife's trying to prevent him to testify versus having Congress want to force him to testify. Does it make a difference? Uh, I think it's a very good question, and what's the opening phrase? These are uncharted, uncharted waters. Um, <laughs> um, so, but, but you're underscoring an important point to me about the posture. So if the courts become involved here, it will be because the Trump administration, the, the White House is invoking the jurisdiction of the courts. The, the White House is claiming executive privilege, and we want a court to enjoin um, uh, Bolton from testifying as a way of upholding the assertion of executive privilege. Um, it may be that Congress would weigh in in this litigation, but it wouldn't, in a formal sense, even be a party in the litigation. It would be a suit against Bolton trying to enjoin his testimony for violation of executive privilege. The flip would be Congress going to the court and asking the court, I think, to direct him to comply with a subpoena. Um, which is not the same posture, and it's possible that a court would see that differently. And, and, and also, uh, the Don McGahn case, is yeah. the, is the, which is further along in the courts, he was the White House counsel, seems to have quite a bit of uh, incriminating information, but does not want to testify, right. but will if, if he's required to, presumably by the, by the courts. Going back to the George Washington yeah. original um, creation of executive privilege, um, if you look at the internal memos they passed around then, they said, we're not giving this up, this is secret. Of course, if it was an impeachment investigation, we'd have to because that's in the Constitution. Right. So this is one of the other things here is, it's one of the rare instances where there's a constitutional command that trumps all the statutory commands under which we live most of the time. Well, I, I mean, to be fair to the proponents of executive privilege, I think they would say that although it doesn't exist explicitly in the text of the Constitution, the privilege that the court has recognized is one that the court takes to be of constitutional dimension as a matter of uh, a principle you know, deducible from the text, if not written explicitly into it. 
it may still be that it's balancing, and it's certainly there's a strong argument that you know when competing constitutional principles are you know are at odds, sometimes you have to rank them, and impeachment may well prevail in that circumstance. Can I offer one yeah. more possibility, which? Uh, is is I don't know I don't want to do probabilities but I think when you I'm going to ask you that in a yes, second. So, okay. Yeah. When you when you litigate executive privilege cases and I litigated one when I was Attorney General in New Jersey on behalf of the governor, um, what often happens is you actually disclose to the court the material that's in dispute, right? So what the president has said here is everything is executive privilege. And that's not true. Even under the, the most ardent supporters of executive privilege would say, actually, it's only communications for the president to make presidential decisions. You know, and so there's a lot that could be, you can't say John Bolton can't say anything. Right. There's a ton he could talk about shy of executive privilege anyway. And so what they could do is really figure out what will Bolton's testimony be? What is the White House asserting privilege as to? And then the senators, you know, ostensibly 51 of them would have to agree whether or not to, to, they would sort of do that balancing test. I don't necessarily think it gets to that, but in a normal court, you would actually show what the materials were, what the con what the conversation was that's at issue, hmm. and then that would be um, taken into consideration. So is there a scenario where the chief justice gets to read the book and then is making question by question determinations himself? I th I'm with Preet that he's a potted plant and he wants to be. <laughs> I, I really, don't you think? I mean, I think he's institutionally trying to stay out of the, stay out of the fight to the extent he can. Mm -hmm. But, you, but the, the point about the book is an important one, which is this makes it a little bit like the Second Circuit case, which was about a subpoena not of the president's taxes from the president, but from his accountant. Right. There's a book. There's a manuscript. There's a publisher. There, there are a lot of people who've seen this document. Does that waive privilege? The president just tweeted that it was full of lies and that he would have gotten us into World War VI if he could have, which I thought was actually <laughs> pretty interesting. Has he waived the privilege by tweeting that it's all damned lies? Uh, you know, it, yes, we already has, have, hasn't he? I, would think I so. mean, the, the fact that he's engaged on the substance and said these things didn't happen, and he's tweeted more than once now about the nature of the conversations that he wants to shield on the basis of executive privilege, I think most people would agree that's a waiver. Yeah, I think um, the the argument that the book is itself a waiver seems strange to me because the privilege would be the president's to assert. But the argument that the president, in responding to what the book is reported to uh, contain, may well have waived it seems a pretty formidable argument. I think you're right. Yeah, but you know, as we were walking in, I haven't read the whole story, and what people have been speculating on is remember that John Bolton's lawyer sent a cover letter to the White House with the book saying, we ask you to do a pre-publication review in an abundance of caution. We don't think there's anything classified in here. It should be done on the normal 30-day timetable, which expires any moment, which is not a law, but you know a guideline. Right. I believe it's the case when we were walking in that the president, I sort of anticipated that he might, has to take the position that they can't bless the book, not on the issue of classification, but to bless the book would also seem to suggest there's no argument on executive privilege when that goes to the heart of what's the, what, what the fight is about in the Senate. So then you have an, a legal impasse between Bolton, his publisher on the one hand, and the president on the other. And Bolton, his publisher, could decide, well, we don't think we actually had to subject this to review in any event. We're going to go ahead and publish it anyway. Then you're sort of a parallel of what we were talking about before. The president then has to go to court to prevent the book from being published, does that fail or does that succeed? And if it fails and they publish it anyway, then d doesn't that render all these arguments about executive privilege moot because it's now available in your bookstore? What do you think? I asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, look, it may it's be a the, question. The, it's the Pentagon Papers case. Yeah, yeah it is. Can they stop the publication of this Amazon bestseller? So we go just, I mean, the, one of the, um, to me, continually striking things about this very unusual presidency is the way in which some of the, the highest stakes constitutional questions that are so high stakes and so delicate that there has been a kind of inter-institutional consensus not to press the issue um, are possibly unavoidable, right? And so we go from the amazing circumstance of What's the role of the court in enforcing or not subpoenas issued by the Senate in its trying, in its capacity of trying an impeachment itself? 
an untested set of questions of enormous significance to layering in the First Amendment and a, pre and a pre publication restraint um, of a book that addresses matters of deep importance to the national security and to the polity. Um, a court that doesn't want to get involved, the chief justice that's trying to keep a low profile is going to have a hard time in this circumstance, I think, which doesn't mean we can predict how it will, how it will turn out. I, we're, we've got about 12 minutes left, and so we'll open it up for questions here. Just to underscore one other point that's been made, as many people here know, the Supreme Court has on its docket, meaning that the chief justice will in his day job capacity, or whenever he's doing it, um, soon be, uh, along with his colleagues, hearing oral argument in March on a set of cases involving the power of Congress, in particular House committees, to subpoena information relating to the president. And, it's, and they're all subpoenas issued to third parties, really, that hold financial records of the president and the like, being vigorously challenged um, by the administration as in excess of Congress's power. Um, that Congress is effectively trying to conduct a kind of criminal investigation, and only the executive branch can do that, although the president is immune, they say, from criminal investigation while in office, and that there is no legitimate legislative purpose behind, um, behind these subpoenas. That argument lost in the D.C. Circuit, and it lost in the Second Circuit, both divided panels, um, really lengthy scholarly opinions written by, on all sides, um, and now before the court. But what everyone accepts as a sort of important premise in all of that is that to the extent there is anything to the argument that Congress is acting in excess of its authority, what really matters is that the House was not acting in exercise of its impeachment authority, that the game changes entirely, even with respect to subpoenas in the House, once we're talking about impeachment. Um, and yet we don't have judicial pronouncements on exactly how much that game changes. And you know, we may, this may be one area where the court issue jurisprudence on the matter is about to quintuple in volume, um, uh, in maybe in the next days, let alone weeks or months. Uh, you may have questions. Uh, if you do, I, I would invite them, and you can come and ask them here at the microphones in the middle um, or on the side. Uh, I have more questions. I can keep asking. Please, we'll take one here. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Um, You've said a couple of times, or a few of you have said uh, it would take 51 uh, senators to, to serve the subpoena. I was wondering what you thought of Neil Katzil's argument on the procedural uh, in, in his Washington Post uh, piece last week saying you could, that the House managers could essentially apply directly to, to Roberts, and maybe the answer is the potted plant wouldn't issue the subpoenas in that scenario, but is he technically right? I tend to be skeptical. So I'm a, I think Neil is an amazing Supreme Court litigator, um, and I, I tend to think he's right on many things. Um, I think there's two problems with the Washington Post. And, and, and to be honest, none of us know. I mean, again, this comes back to the sort of Neil is making his best guess based on he's arguing that the Chief Justice has the power. I think that ultimately this is the Senate's process, and this is that the Senate gets to make the rules. And so if you have 51 senators to make the rules, that's what's gonna happen in my view. And couple that with Robert's lack of desire to actually be either A, making the decisions or B, being overridden by senators who could then vote to change the rules. Like to me, he has no, that's bad institutionally, I think. And Roberts, in my view, is an institutionalist in many ways and would like to get out of this with as little harm to the judiciary and to the role of the Supreme Court as possible. So I think it's a very creative argument. I think it's interesting. We don't know exactly what will happen, but I, I'm, not, I'm not completely convinced on it. There's one other twist, which is slightly less fan fiction than the House <laughs> managers doing it themselves, which is you could have a 50-50 tie. And typically, when there's a 50-50 tie, the presiding officer, the vice president, casts the deciding vote. Does Roberts get to cast the deciding vote? I think he lets it fail. I think if we see 50-50, Roberts lets it fail. So if there's like a, a motion for a subpoena, it ties 50-50, yes, the presiding officer usually would cast the vote. My bet is that he says, you need 51 senators to decide. I'm not, I, the motion fails. That's, that's a probable, that's a guess, again. While we're talking about probabilities, um, 
uh, I'd love to hear from each of you um, your, your sense of two things. Um, one, are we going to hear from witnesses? Uh, and two, what will the ultimate vote be? Preet? <laughs> <laughs> The ultimate vote, I mean, on yes, on, we, we on, will on we will hear from witnesses, either in the Senate or on cable television. <laughs> <laughs> there was it was a there was a funny remark. You know, we, we haven't talked about Lev Parnas. Talk about ducking the question. Which, I know. Well, that's what I do. <laughs> you know, we, we Lev 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 Parnas because you have no subpoena power over. <laughs> um, we'll see. <laughs> you know, it's, it's someone quipped actually about you know this this person who has been indicted by my former office, the Southern District, uh, associate of uh, Rudy Giuliani. Someone said, you know, it's so interesting that the Senate is choosing to take testimony via cable television <laughs> of Lev Parnas. So, you know, I, I, just, I just don't know. I mean, I think it, it's, it's such a fraught political question. I can see the senators realizing there's really no good option for them to vote down totally. Testimony from John Bolton looks terrible to allow t testimony from John Bolton and then opening up a Pandora's box and maybe extended litigation from their perspective, also terrible. So I, you know, I'm gonna say I, I, I slightly, I, I'm in, I will slightly lean to the side that says we'll hear from at least John Bolton, a tiny bit above 50%. Okay. So last week I predicted that everything would be over this Friday. And so I think no one should Trust my predictions, um, <laughs> because we really, I mean, you know, some of this is the question of is Mitch McConnell is very good at keeping discipline in his ranks. And so, you know, the Bolton revelation, it's like a little bit of, if that hadn't come out yesterday, I don't think we would have seen witnesses, to be honest. And so now I think there's a real question of whether we will. I personally think we should. Um, I agree with Preet very strongly that if we see witnesses, we will not, I, I don't think we'll see a lot, and I think that McConnell will do everything he can to make it as slim and as, as little as possible. Um, as to the ultimate vote, I think right now the president absolutely still has the votes to not be removed. I don't think there's any question at this moment in time. But again, what's really interesting about this is that even, you know, before, yeah, two days ago, I would have said it's completely a done deal on witnesses, and now I feel like there's some movement. And so, you know, my bet is more likely than not witnesses, but I, I'm, I'm not 90% sure, you know, or I, I wouldn't, you know, really bet hard on it. And I, I do think it's likely, just given the narrative, the momentum, the twists and turns, that there, that there will be witnesses. Um, but I don't think it'll only be Bolton. I think the Republicans will have within their rights to call Hunter Biden or whoever they think is the right witness. And, and I think the Democrats have been skillful in treating this as an illegitimate trade. But honestly, if you're in a trial, if both sides get to call witnesses, um, there will be appeals perhaps to Roberts as to whether the testimony is relevant. Is relevant. But I think that's another one where he's highly likely to kind of duck under the, under the desk. I'll throw out one more, the, the baseball manager, Yogi Berra, once said, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> and I'll make one more prediction about the future, which is there's another constitutional spectacle coming our way on Tuesday. <laughs> the State of the Union address is also in the Constitution. And he's giving the State of the Union, and he either is giving it in the middle of the trial or as an end zone victory dance. And it will be very interesting to see how with Nancy Pelosi sitting behind him and Adam Schiff sitting in front and the Supreme <laughs> Court all sitting there, uh, how much self-restraint our president shows. <laughs> One job I don't want is that of trying to persuade the president to remain restrained in that context. Um, this has been just a, a fantastic conversation. I should note that we are it's been a terrific panel. It was going to be even better in the sense that we were hoping to have Melissa Murray with us, but she's, I think, having essentially the same conversation on television, either CNN or MSNBC right now. Um, and so we're, we're sorry to miss her, but very glad uh, to have had these uh, panelists here, and I hope you'll all join me in thanking them for their conversation. <laughs>